microservice is done for you up, but you're not ready for a whole grain, then uh, stick around because Rod Coat, the uh, CTO of Purple, is going to tell us all about uh, micro multi grain services. Multi grain, yes. Please, uh, please welcome Rod. Right. Thank you. All right, so I know it's late in the afternoon after lunch. It might be a little bit sleepy, so we're going to go really fast. We've got 70 slides in 20 minutes. Let's, let's do it. All right, microservices, good for some stuff, not good for everything, right? Let's not throw out everything we've known before and assume that they've, microservices solve every problem. So I'm CTO of Perforce. I've worked at some large companies, some small ones, do a lot of conferences, talk, but you don't care about that. You want to take a pop quiz right now. Which one is better? It's big, it's clunky, does one thing, kind of easy to understand, but really hard to change. It's the monolith. Or option B, they're small. They're made of every different technology mo known to man, easy to replace, easy to upgrade, but good luck trying to figure out the big picture. They're the microservices. Or option C, they're a mix of legacy technology, modern, all thrown in together. They're every size from big to huge. They make a purist head swim, but they're sort of practical. They're the mini services. So which one's best? Kind of depends on what you're doing, right? Yeah, let's see. Go through the talk and see if you still agree at the end. All right, so microservices kind of focused on one business feature, independent, developed indiv independently, different teams, different technologies, one data store, no sharing of the data. It's important. Many services relax constraints a little bit, tend to group some tightly coupled services together. They can share data stores and relax some other dependencies, but it's a little slippery slope. We'll talk about that. And microservices, basically monoliths, the traditional stuff we've been building a long time with an API stuck on it. One big database, one big app, traditional three-tier kind of applications, right? Each serve different purposes. On the right, you get more flexibility, more choice, more agility, looser coupling. On the left, you get lower complexity. You can understand what's going on. There are fewer moving parts easier to deploy and run, right? So don't, don't think just micro, think multi-grain. What granularity makes sense? What are you trying to achieve? All right, so first the monolith. We, we think we know this pretty well, but let's recap pros and cons. This is, if you can read that, kind of the negative connotation of a monolith. Oh, it's one god-awful hairball of code. Nobody can understand it. Whatever you do, don't touch it. It'll break. We don't have any tests. We don't know how to fix it again. Leave it alone. Well, that's not necessarily the case. This is also a monolith, right? Nice layers, clean architecture, decoupling, uses of, of interfaces. There are other ways to build software than, than big hairballs. And this is technically not a monolith. It's not one big code base, but this is kind of the modern monolith, of, as people think of it. Three-tier architecture, web server, database, right, app server, can still be cleanly separated can still use good design, good architecture, can still be horizontally scalable, but this is kind of the modern monolith. This is what we're told is bad every day by the microservices gang, right? Who's, who's got microservices in production right now? Who wishes they didn't? Okay, not too many people lowered their hands, that's good. Usually there's a bunch of groans when I ask that question, like, oh God, it's so horrible. It's not always bad, but it's not always good either. If you've heard of Conway's Law, this is, kind of why we got the three-tier architecture. The law basically says however your organization is structured people-wise, if you've got a team of DBAs and a team of UI people and a team of business logic people, you're gonna get an architecture that looks the same, right? So monoliths can tend to look like this. Microservices will look different as we'll see in a few minutes. So monolith cultural, cultures can be traditionally top-down command and control you do this, stay in your box, this is a dev team, this is a QA team, this is the database team. Don't talk, there's lots of animosity, right? Negative. Waterfall-ish can be slow, big front, big upfront design and big test and slow deployments. Vertical scalability, buy a bigger box if you want it to go faster, all the negatives. But it can be agile or scaled agile. agile. You can use feature team, you can release, release faster CI and CD and, horizontally scale, not all negatives. So versioning issues tend to be less with a monolith. You, you kind of have to agree on version stuff. This is the database we're using, here's the major version. You don't get to have one of every flavor. So less issues in some sense. Also less latency, right? If you're calling one piece of code from another piece of code in the same 
executing process, that's fast. If now suddenly you're making calls over the network, that's slow. You don't have to worry so much about latency in a monolith. You definitely do in microservices. We'll see that. Transactions are often much easier because you've got fewer moving parts. You've got one database. Right? You don't have to worry about lots of saga patterns and eventual consistency and things that are very painful from a development point of view, even though they, they sound cool and fun. Um, they sound cool and fun until something fails and you have to dig out what went wrong. Right? Monoliths also typically have one of a lot of things, one code base, one set of artifacts, one build process, one language or, or a few languages that you develop in, one platform, one major set of tools. Right? Everybody kind of knows what you're, you kind of get it. A developer can move from this feature team to this feature team, they're using all the same stuff. It's not like I have to learn a brand new world. Oh, this is a JavaScript, and that's Erlang, and that's Python, and I don't even know what that is. Right? Easier to move things around and, and share knowledge sometimes. Challenges and why people are moving away from monoliths, there are a lot of downsides. There are no small changes. Sometimes it's very difficult to make a tweak and not break things in unknown ways. You can get locked into technology. I think that's a really big one. Right? You can be stuck on the same stack for 10 years or more because you can't change one bit, you have to change all or none, and that's usually when you change none. Scale all or nothing, you typically have to replicate boxes, entire applications in order to get scale. You can't just scale to one piece that you really need to move up. Deployments can be heavyweight. I said versioning can be easier because you only deploy one, but you might fight about which one. This team wants to move forward to the new version of the database, this one doesn't. Right? Which one wins? Now that now that's a political cultural challenge, not a technical one. One bug could take down the entire app. Not a good thing. So you can't move the containers sometimes. You make big heavy apps that assume they're getting whole physical machines, not even VMs, and, and now where do you, what do you do with all the space? You kind of made assumptions. It can be hard to move to containers, so hard to move to cloud, hard to scale out in new ways. So if you're gonna do monoliths, follow the best practices, at least be agile, use CI and CD and DevOps and automate. Use layers, horizontally scale, use development accelerators, you know, things like if you're in a Java world, things like JRebel that let you go straight from writing code to change the running VM. You don't have to build and deploy and, and go through the process. So you can pretend like you're in a microservice world <laughs> and move faster, even though you're a monolith. So use all the cheats you can to make a monolith better before you just decide to, to chuck it. All right, so various grains and granularity of services. So SOA, remember this? It's not a bad thing. It had a bad implementation in a lot of sense, a lot of cases. So logically grouping activities, self-contained black boxes, right? Distributed, separately maintained and deployed. Sound familiar? Sounding microservicey. It wasn't originally SOAP with the S stands for simple, by the way. Don't crack me up every time I see it. Right? Web service star, all the hundreds of specs nobody can understand, heavy process, ESBs, central IT, right? Those are all implementation details. SOA is still a good idea, a, a clear set service. How you implement it makes a big difference. One way to do it, microservices. I'm sure you're hearing lots about that all the time, but in a nutshell, it's kind of the Unix concept. Do one small thing, do it well, and then glue a bunch of those small things together to build a bigger system. My own definition is very buzzword loaded. It's like SOA for distributed teams in a world of DevOps. Modern technology way to implement SOA, distributed. And of course you need to use good clean design, not sharing data stores, et cetera. So back to Conway's law. So we talked about monoliths to scale up. You basically have to replicate everything. You only need one little, one little feature isn't keeping up with the scale of your user base. You have to duplicate all of it. Microservices, you just duplicate the one piece that's in highest demand. A lot more flexible, a lot more efficient use of your resources. So some characteristics, talking over the network, independent deployed, easy to replace, easy to upgrade, wrapped around ideally business functionality, small bits and pieces, independent implemented, small again, automated, elastic, all the good things, all the reasons people want to move to microservices. A lot of people slip up on this one. You can't share the data stores to do true microservices. They are truly independent. You can't be relying on another team to agree with you on the data store and the schema and the versions and all that, you have to be able to go at the speed you need to go at, which means completely decoupled, completely isolated and independent. That also ideally means no synchronous 
communication, no arrest, no HTTP between the services. You don't want cascading timeouts and other kinds of cascading failures. You have to be really careful about that. So you need to use all async, right? Messaging, deal with eventual consistency, deal with compensating operations. Once you do this and everybody has the mindset, this can work well, but it can be a very painful transition. Right? It's a lot easier said than done. I think SOA is more about kind of a business strategy. I think microservices are more implementation, technical, strategic versus project specific. Microservices, a lot of definitions are one-offs. You don't share them. I think you can debate that a little bit, but in an ideal world, they're not shared. They're specific purpose built for the need and they're sort of disposable. You can think of those terms. SOA is more about sharing. They both favor flexibility and evolutionary refinement, so that's good. So some pros and some cons there. So advantages, biggest advantage I think over for microservices, you tackle small problems. Everybody gets it. Everybody on the team is thinking about one little thing, one problem to solve. So you get small teams creating small solutions using the best tools for the job. And those tools can change from job to job. You can very quickly try and adapt a new platform, a new tool, right? a brand new approach. You don't have to worry about a lot of legacy holding you down because you didn't write that much code in the first place. To make it work though, I think you have to make a lot of decisions. Right? This, is, this can be challenging, right? How, how do you get these things to talk? We've seen in previous talk speakers offering up various suggestions. Do you use proxies? Do you use a service mesh like an Istio? Right. How do they communicate? GRPC, HTTP, some other flavor, REST, right. GraphQL? How do, you, how do you communicate in a team? How do you let each other know I'm deprecating this service or I'm adding a new feature to this API or I need a new parameter now or I can no longer accept this parameter? So how do you communicate with the people? How do you deal with state? Where do we save this stuff? Kubernetes, stateful sets? Something else, a shared data store? Do we each have our own independent database that we maintain? Is there no leveraging, no economies of scale at all? What do we think about that? How do we coordinate things like uh, deployment, CI, CD? Does every single team do their own, roll their own? Their own CI, CD, their own deployment, their own cadence? Or do you share some tools? Do you have standard, this is the Jenkins we're gonna use, and here's the standard set of tools. What about monitoring, metrics, traceability, debugging, analytics? It does every single team make their own decision for all those? Do you wind up with 50 monitoring tools and then you glue together dashboards or you do, do you choose one and then share dashboards? A lot of decisions to be made that we didn't have to think about with the monolith. There's one. Right. So some challenges, big one, it's distributed computing. This is hard. I don't believe anybody who says otherwise. You have to deal with things like the network. Things go down, things time out, things fail. There will be problems. It's a much higher cognitive load. Think about all the presentations you're seeing on microservices at, at this conference and others. How much more new stuff do you have to think about than you did you know, a couple years ago when it was like, I gotta write the function, I gotta test it, it's gotta be fast and secure. Even now it's hard. Now it's like, what about all this other stuff I have to think about? It's just, it's just a lot. I have now maybe hundreds of services. How do I, how do I know who is doing what? How do I discover those services? What if they're competing? Which one do I choose? There's just a lot more thinking that you have to do up front. And team dynamics, I think this is another one. It's easy if you're on a microservices team to have your service succeed. Like this is doing really well. Well, the company failed and we were out of business because I wasn't looking anywhere else, but this is a really good microservice. That's a new thing to think about. Fallacies in distributed computing always call, come up. I think I, my, my favorite one to pick on, latency is zero. You have this big graph or tree of microservices calling each other, you're adding latency with every hop. And what about the poor user that click, clicked a button on a web page is now sitting around twiddling their thumbs waiting for the answer, We're like, yes, but we have amazing throughput. You're gonna love it in two minutes when you get to see the response. You're gonna be so happy. They're not gonna be happy. So automate, if you're gonna go this route, you're gonna wind up, maybe you start with just a few microservices, you can end up with hundreds or thousands you could start messing with these things by hand, but very quickly you're gonna to wanna to automate as much as possible. All the way from code committed to fully tested, deployed, the, what are you using, Kubernetes, CI, CD, whatever you're gonna do, it's gotta be automated. Get the humans out of the loop. There's too, much, too many moving parts to keep track of 
by sysadmins, et cetera. So true DevOps, automatic failover. You know, monitoring has to automatically respond and have self-healing because you're always gonna be in a state of partial failure. Think about a system with hundreds of microservices running all at once on hundreds of VMs or hundreds of containers, many of them scaled up, all communicating over networks, running on VMs. Things freeze, zombie processes, network cards back up, disk go down, all kinds of stuff goes wrong. In fact, you'll always be in a state of recovery. Some service is always gonna be recovering from a failure at all points in time. So don't cross your fingers and hope it stays up. All of it has to be automated so that it self heals. You can't have people getting in a loop to fix this stuff when it goes bad, because it's always gonna be going bad. You can't let the user see that it's going bad. You gotta recover automatically on the fly. So best practices, extreme automation. <coughs> you probably get in that hand. Use things like service mesh, API management, uh, we'll talk about those next. And monolith first, maybe controversial, but I kind of agree with this. In a lot of ways, if you're starting a brand new project and you don't know how it's gonna go, it's a lot easier to start with a monolith where everybody has an understanding and you can focus on the business result and not all this other stuff that, that's gonna be baggage up front. Get it working first, make sure you get funded and you're showing value, and then maybe transition to microservices. It's easier to get your head around, it's easier to show success. So whichever path you go, you need API management. It, I kind of think of it as the security front door hits your API uh, firewall to the rest of the world because every hacker in the world can access your APIs if you put them on the internet. What gives you consistent security and fault tolerance and policy enforcement, et cetera, across all the different teams building all the different APIs? You don't want everybody building their own security in a different way, right? You need one consistent way to do that. That's what API management gives you. Similarly, on the implementation of the microservices side, something like a service mesh, like an Istio, and there are others, gives you the same kind of consistent security, deployment, telemetry, traceability, things like that for the microservice implementations themselves. So think API management tend to be central, <coughs> one, security is key, availability, auditability, policy enforcement, visibility, those kind of things for the business, you know, protect the front door. Service mesh is more about internal, lots of ways to do it. There's gonna be many of these, lots of different technologies. It's about going fast and trying new things, getting the benefits of microservices. Consistently, again, so every team doesn't have to build all this from scratch. And then your, your API gateway that goes forward to traffic to your microservices and deals with converting protocols and data and whatnot. So some of the analysts are saying this is the way of the future, right, microservices and apps. Uh, the sort of mesh architecture, right, where you've got fewer big, giant, heavy applications like in the old days. It's more like small apps that use services, some of which use microservices. They can be cloud, they can be hybrid, they can be on-premises, but this kind of graph that you're assembling and can get some reuse of services. Uh, Martin Fowler kind of shows us that there's an overhead, though, that you pay. If, if you look at kind of the green line of productivity of monolith, actually starts higher because you don't have to think about all this other stuff up front. You can just start making progress on your business value. And then over time, however, as the monolith gets bigger and bigger and more complex and, and harder to change, that's when microservices start to share their value. Right? So could you start with monolith and migrate? Yeah, you can. There's things like the strangler pattern. I've, I've done talks you can look up if you want to hear more from me about this, but there are ways to, to migrate from one to the other after you can show some success. 